Good afternoon, everyone. We've tried to go through the Unseen Poetry section remotely. It's not particularly easy um, when we're not in the same room, which I'm a little bit worried about. So what I'm doing is I'm creating a quick video just to kind of recap where we've got up to so far, and then I'll finish off the analysis of the initial poem that we're looking at so that when I see you tomorrow, we'll be able to have a look at uh, the next couple of poems and we can start thinking about how these poems all link together. Okay, so from the very start of this, I didn't want to do the work for you. I've tried as much as possible to give you the autonomy. I know you've had a go at this. I know you've got all your notes at home. Um, so what I'm just doing is just to push us a little bit further through and um, fill in those gaps so that we're in a better position for tomorrow. Just a quick reminder, this is the exam paper that we are having a go at. It's the sample paper. And uh, the question that we're looking at is this one. It's section B, unseen poetry. Compare the presentation of birds in poem A with either B, C or D. If you don't have, have a copy of this, uh, just send me an email. I've got it in PDF version, so I can email that over to you without any problems. As you know, we have to talk about poem A. Poem A is going to be a major part of our essay. And then the decision we have once we've analysed poem A is which one of these poems you'd like to talk about. Please remember, you can't talk about all of them. You're only allowed to talk about two. One of them must be poem A. So the next decision is which one of these poems would you prefer to talk about? The uh, poem B was called um, Returning, We Hear the Larks. Uh, poem C was Red Kites at Tregaron. And then poem D is Parrot by Stevie Smith. These are the beautiful notes that we made today. Um, if anyone missed the lesson, this is what we've talked about. All of the notes are currently on your screen. I will really quickly recap the ideas that we've picked out today. Um, but the idea is if I sh finish off this poem for you so that we can have a look at you know, what themes, what ideas we'd be picking out to link to the next poem. One of the first things we mentioned today then is how we've got this image of a battered road. Your ideas were that many people take these types of paths as particularly undesirable. It seems to be broken in some way. It seems to have been beaten quite hard. There's a sense of monotony here. Everyone following exactly the same road, which might suggest a singular path and destination. This road seems to have degraded over time, much like life. So we might consider the battered road a metaphor for our path through life and how we can't really veer away from its inevitable conclusion. We also talked about the word harrows. Harrows are ploughs, we've talked about that, but these harrows are lying at rest, so they've paused. You talked about how that is quite a dangerous thing um, and that these dangerous objects are not used at the moment, but they are objects of destruction rather than creation. You mentioned about how spreading far and wide, we have a juxtaposition between the imagery of the battered road compared to this natural imagery. You've suggested that the road is limiting and that nature is expansive. We talked briefly about the russet clods and how that's brown earth and perhaps that shows emptiness and how it is fixed and it never moves. You also talked about the sprouting its spiry points and your suggestions here were that We've got an image of growth. We've got something quite sharp. It points towards the sky and um, it seems to be trying to escape. And there might be some religious connotations here, suggesting that maybe there's religious guidance and maybe it takes us towards heaven. Uh, the final thing you talked about, about these first four lines, was the tender green image. You suggested that this was gentle and soft and there was a juxtaposition between this image and the battered road. And maybe nature offers solace from our monotony. You talked about that juxtaposition and this verdant growth there too, and that's the opposite to the dull brown we saw in the previous line. You haven't mentioned the word corn, which is quite interesting, and I think there's a lot to uh, consider there, but I'm not going to fill that in for you. I'll move on to the next couple of lines. Again, just reiterating the ideas that you've given. These are not my points, these are your points. You talked about this hair that is squatting and you suggested that it is low to the ground and therefore it cannot escape the world. Um, you see the natural image of the corn trying to escape, but this hair can't escape. You talked about the brown clod. You talked about how that's brown earth. And again, that shows that emptiness and how it's fixed and how it is unmoving. You didn't talk about that was a simile, but that's fine. That will come later um, because you've got a similarity here between the brown clod and you've got the hair that cannot escape either. You didn't talk about um, terrors wide awake. We could perhaps have linked that idea that uh, this hair 
is awake, starkly awake in a reality that seems to be painful. Um, perhaps we could juxtapose that with the gentleness of those boys who are resting um, underneath those hedgerows. Uh, you could even link that to later on to when the bird seems to be startled. Okay, plenty to talk about. I'm not going to add too much here. Um, you mentioned about how uh, these harrows failed to break. And that might show that nature is unbeatable. I think that was one of your points. And then we talked about while neath the warm hedge boys stray far from home. And if we're looking at the connotations of home, normally we're thinking of a place where we belong, where we are comfortable and warm, perhaps a place of family. And because these people are away from home, it might suggest that they are displaced. The fact that the word stray there definitely suggests that there's a sense of being lost. And perhaps these boys are trying to escape, much like the, the hare would escape if it could. Um, you then mentioned about how the word crop, that verb, shows you know, that this is something that is going to be cut down. And the boys seem to be destroying this. Mankind seems to be destroying this. Um, and it seems to be the result um, in the, uh, it results in the hare's fear. The next details that you analysed, we looked at the word eager. So where buttercups will make them eager run, open their golden caskets to the sun. And you suggested there were connotations of energy and perhaps freedom. So perhaps this natural uh, gift that comes from Mother Earth seems to be uh, a temporary escape from the tediousness of their lives. And perhaps there's a desperation to escape there too. You mentioned how the word hurry, so these boys are hurrying, um, would suggest that this is quite a frantic image, it's not relaxed at all, and perhaps there's a contrast to the elegance of the bird. When the bird flies, it doesn't seem to have any worry at all, whereas the word hurry suggests there's a little bit of panic involved with these boys. The final detail on these uh, four lines you looked at was the word flies, and this is the moment where we first see the bird. Up until this point, the bird's not even mentioned. This is the moment where the bird is introduced, so it must be fairly important. You suggested that the word fly has connotations of escape and freedom. One of you mentioned how that's almost like a phoenix rising from the ashes. Perhaps the ashes is the earth that seems to be devoid of life or devoid of safety. Um, and we could suggest that that was a metaphor as well. This bird might symbolise hope and happiness. Really good analysis, really pleased with what you've said. You then mentioned how half-formed might show that mankind is disturbing nature and that this bird hasn't been able to create their nest because mankind came across and ruined its chance. You mentioned how happy wings gives a sense of euphoria um, and how this bird, because it is able to escape, it means it can move to a place of happiness and joy. I would suggest its wings give it transcendence, something that the boys will never receive. And I think the last thing you mentioned before we were un rudely interrupted was uh, Cloud She Sings. And we mentioned the fact that that was quite heavenly imagery. The, uh, the word cloud suggests a soft and fluffy place, uh, perhaps a place of perfect escape. It's dreamlike world. And the word sing also suggests happiness. We've got an ethereal image, it's almost too good to be true, a place that cannot exist on Earth. And we also talked about that quality of it being mistiness, almost like a mirage or an illusion. So from here, I'll give you some extra ideas of what we might um, pick out in the exam situation. I'm sure you'll have noticed some of these anyway. And if there's something I mentioned that you haven't thought about, that's completely normal. If I had the time to speak to you about this in length, you would come up with ideas that I wouldn't have come up with either. So the first thing I'll mention then is we've got the word winnows. This bird winnows, and I think that's quite a playful verb. You've got that sense of pleasure and enjoyment. This bird seems to be energetic. It's actually enjoying its ability to fly in the sky. I'd also juxtapose the word air, and because I think air is light, and it suggests that this bird has no burdens at all, it's carefree, I would probably juxtapose that with the heavy and dense imagery that we had towards the start of the poem. Because I think when we were looking at the hair and when we were looking at the russet clod, that's very hard and dense and uh, not particularly productive. Now we've got light and carefree imagery, so perhaps talking about how the tone seems to change slightly, from talking about the boys and the hare to when we actually get to see this bird, that might be quite fruitful in an exam situation. I would also suggest that this 
you know, bird who is uh, in the cloud and she sings, then hangs a dust spot in the sunny skies. I don't literally think the bird turns into a dust spot, therefore I would suggest that is a metaphor. And that metaphor shows the distance, the distance between the bird and those people who are confined to the world. And perhaps this bird shows that it can escape, and that it can move so far away from reality that it's barely seen or barely perce perceptible. This bird seems to transcend, it seems to move away from the, the monotony of the world and enter a place of um, prosperity. We could also talk about the sunny skies. Notice how I've used a yellow font there. I know, super clever. And that is pathetic fallacy, I would suggest. There's also sibilance being used there too. But that pathetic fallacy, using that weather to represent something, suggests perhaps a place of freedom and happiness, a place of warmth and growth and prosperity. I think probably a little bit different to what we saw at the start of this, um, of this particular poem. I would then talk about how it moves from being incredibly far away, that dust spot in the sky, to and drops and drops. So the bird returns. Perhaps that alliteration symbolises that descent away from that magical place in the sky back down to reality. And then this bird ends up in her nest she lies. We might talk about nest and its comfort and its place of belonging. There's lots of things in there we can talk about. These are some of the things you might have mentioned. We might like to pick out the fact that the boy's unheeding past, suggesting that these boys never knew this bird even existed. They didn't even know it was there. It was at once concealed and then all of a sudden revealed itself. It was the disturbance that revealed this bird to them. They, they were entirely oblivious of this bird and they would never be given the same opportunity. We could mention the fact that uh, we have near dreaming then that birds which flew so high. These boys are suggesting that they would act differently. They would never dream of returning back to a nest if they could escape. So these boys can only escape in, the, in their dreams. There seems to be no freedom for them. They're trapped in this existence. And there's a sense of envy here. These boys would like to be like the bird. But obviously they never will be. They don't have that same gift. The bird which flew so high would drop again. That's what they would not do if they were the bird. They wouldn't return. These boys want real escape. They would like the careless, carefree attitude that that freedom would bestow upon them. And they're suggesting that they would act very differently to this bird. Because this bird who flew so high has been able to do the one thing that they can't, transcend to a better place, to escape their mortal existence. If you'd like to talk about two nests upon the ground where anything may come out to destroy, there's a suggestion here that the ground is not a place of protection. We can link that really clearly to some of the imagery we saw at the start of the, the poem. We can talk about the hair that's trembling because it's scared, it's easily destroyed. That vulnerability we see in this poem when we're stuck on earth like these boys are. The word anything might show that there are multiple threats on earth. The world is full of danger, full of things that seek to destroy us. And then the final line on this slide may come at to destroy. We've got a sense of inevitability here, suggesting that something at some point will enter our consciousness and hurt us. Reality is filled of potential threat. Reality is a place of hostility, of destruction, of pain and suffering. And these boys would like to escape it, much like the corn is trying to escape its inevitable, um, its inevitable harvest. And also the hare seems to be wanting to escape all of that pain and suffering too. And then they say, had they the wing, and obviously that sentence continues, but they're suggesting that they would act differently. These boys, if they had that gift of the wing, that ability to fly, they would not act in the same way. They're imagining their freedom now. Now for me, I might suggest that the bird is an object of their envy, but it's also inspiring them to dream. That bird, that image becomes an image of hope and it allows them to imagine. So even though it's something they're jealous of, it has also given them the gift of escape, even if it's briefly or momentary. Had they the wing like such a bird? What they do is they compare themselves 
to what they would do and how this bird does something different. So they're considering how they would capitalise on this gift of flight that this bird has been given. And they wouldn't squander it. They wouldn't return to reality if they could. What they're doing is they're seeking real escape from their lives. So that image of a bird seems to be an image of escape, of freedom, that these uh, boys don't have. And they think themselves would be too proud and build on nothing but a passing cloud. The passing cloud here, the word build, might suggest that they want to be productive. They want to improve their life. They want to change their lives immeasurably, be in a different place. They wouldn't trap themselves as they are now. They would travel perpetually, constantly moving, constantly being free, and they'd have autonomy. They could choose where they go or go anywhere but here. There seems to be no structure or predestined path or fate, and that's what they want to escape. They want to escape from having to do things. Instead, they'd like to choose to do things, to be the master of their own destinies. We might talk about how they would like to build on nothing but a passing cloud as free from danger as, so this is a beginning of a simile, but the word danger there shows that's what they're trying to escape from. They're trying to escape from the worry and the pain and the threat, that constant worry that something bad is going to happen, that terrified hair that we saw at the start of this poem, is very similar to how these boys feel. And then the simile concludes with, as the heavens are free from pain and toil, they want to escape. They want to transcend to a place of heavenly inspiration. They want to move to a place of godliness because that image of perfection is incredibly distant to their reality. They want to be somewhere else. They no longer want to exhibit the pain and the suffering of life. And the poet mentions that. These are the two things they're trying to escape from. They're trying to escape from the pain and the toil, the exhaustion, the discomfort, being trapped in suffering, being trapped in their jobs, being trapped with no escape. And there would they build and be, and obviously the sentence continues, but the word there would suggest that they don't want to be here. Here is a place of pain and toil, Therefore, I want to go elsewhere. And they seek to start a new life in a place with freedom. Cast aside all of the structure in their lives. Move away from that beaten track that they have to follow. And instead, live in the clouds and follow their whims and whinny in, in, which, uh, winnow in any way they want to, uh, in the, the way they want to go. So we have an image of freedom in juxtaposition to the constraints that they feel. There they would build and be and sail about the world to scenes unheard of and unseen. For me, the word sail, that particular verb, seems to show that freedom, that pleasure, making life not painful and suffering, but a pleasure cruise. Something to enjoy, something to, you know, you're supposed to enjoy the experience of being alive, and that's what they seek. They've repeated the word and, they could have used commas, but John Clare's decided to use and repeatedly. Again, suggesting that freedom to choose, that freedom to enjoy things, instead of being forced to do the same thing over and over again. And what are they looking forward to? They, they would um, want to see the world. They would want to you know, go to world to scenes unheard of and unseen. These boys will never have the opportunity to travel the world, to see interesting things. They desire new experiences. They want to get away from the dreariness of reality. These boys will never have any opportunity. And they dream one day of having the opportunity to do what they want and to see things they'll never have the chance to see. And then we have the dash, we have that pause, and it says, Oh, were they but a bird? That's what they want. And they start to imagine what they would do with that freedom. If I was a bird, what would I do? This reminds me of those people who spend their whole lives imagining what they'd do if they won the lottery. And they say, oh, I'd give up my job or I'd go on a cruise. That's exactly what these boys are doing. They're saying, if I could be a bird to escape, I would. I'd be gone. I would go and see the world. I would go and do interesting things. They seem to be yearning for that bird's ability to escape. They then say, so think they while they listen to its song. This is the thought that is going through their heads while they're listening to this bird. So this bird is inspiring their imaginations. 
they begin to imagine what they would do with this freedom. So the song that the bird seems to be singing is pleasurable and it gives them company. And it allows them to smile and fancy. So because it allows them to imagine a pleasurable scene, that bird song does actually allow them to escape. The one thing that they say I wish I could do is the one thing they can do because they can escape their work through the imagination. And where does the imagination come from? Well, it comes from that bird. That bird has inspired them to consider something better. The final thing I'd mention is, and so pass along. I think this bird's song has inspired that level of um, creativity in their mind. They're imagining what their lives would be like and they're no longer suffering. They're no longer suffering through their work because their minds are elsewhere. Their minds are in the sky. Their minds are flying around, not literally confined to earth like their bodies are. So this bird does give them an ability to escape, not literally, but metaphorically. And it allows them to tolerate their work. This brings us to the final two lines of the poem. While its low nest moist with the dews of morn lies safely with the leveret in the corn. We have the word low being used here, and I think that shows that the bird is still on the ground. It is the boys who have managed to escape. Ironically, the bird is exactly where they are, and yet their minds have been transported to a different place. They've been able to transcend the pain and the toil because they are free of those fears, and they are now metaphorically escaping into imaginary lands. So it hasn't escaped the danger at all, but it has given the gift of escape to those boys who are working in the fields. When it says their nest is moist with the dews of morn, that makes me think that this is a morning. This is an early time of day. Now, it asks us the question of why these boys are here. I mean, it's fairly obvious that these boys are here to cut the corn. They are farm workers. They're there to harvest. They're there to cut what is in the field. So the day is going to progress and inevitably that will bring destruction. And ironically, it is the boys themselves that cause the destruction. It is the boys that cause the pain and the suffering that they are trying to escape from. So the bird is the one that has a more um, difficult life. The boys have been allowed to escape momentarily. And they lie safely with the leveret in the corn. But they're lying safely. We know that they are not going to be safe for long. That leveret, the leveret is a, um, a name for a very young hare. It's the hare that's mentioned at the start of this poem. That hare is in danger. It's scared. And this bird is not going to be safe for long, much like that hare is not going to be safe for long. And these boys are the threat that it will need to escape from. The leveret in the corn, those are the things that are going to be disturbed or destroyed. The leveret is going to be um, displaced. The corn is going to be cut down. These are the things that the boys are going to do. And ironically, it's the thing that they suggested they wanted to escape from. So by watching this video, hopefully it's allowed us just to move a little bit further ahead than we would be if, we, if I was still in the classroom and you were still at home. It's incredibly difficult to teach you unseen poetry and approaches to it when I'm not literally in the same room as you. It couldn't be any more difficult. It's probably the worst topic that we could be doing um, in a remote learning style. But, you know, we will deal with these problems. We will uh, do everything we possibly can. But by making this video, I've done the one thing I didn't want to do which was tell you things, teach you things. When it comes to unseen poetry, I'm not there. And that's a brilliant thing, I shouldn't be there. It should be you and your ability to analyze and the ideas that you could bring to the table. So that's why when in, we were in our lesson today, I tried to say as little as possible and I allowed you to give me your ideas because there's no point in me teaching you things. So I've broken my rule really, I didn't want to teach you anything, but I had to go over the final part of the poem, otherwise we'd spend all of our time analysing poem one, then it would be Christmas, and then we wouldn't have had a chance to have a look at the unseen poetry section in the way I'd have liked to. So our job on Thursday, now that we have a fairly decent understanding of poem A, and please don't think I've explained everything to you, there is so much more depth we could talk about. We haven't even touched form and structure yet, but that will come. 
what we'll do tomorrow is we'll have a look at poem B. We'll read it through. And as we read through, I'm hoping your brain has little moments of epiphany where you can see a very clear connection with the poem that we've read in depth. We'll have a look at poem C, we'll have a look at poem D, and as a group we'll pick a poem and we will read through and you can pick out how things are similar or different, any images that reoccur and how they show those similarities or differences. Okay, so I'm hoping this is useful for you. Again, apologies, unseen poetry remotely is probably the worst idea in the world. But if you watch this video before our lesson, at least we're in a better position to finish before Christmas and actually have covered this major unit. Because after Christmas, we get to have some fun looking at um, some Shakespeare as well. Okay, so I will see you on Thursday. So long.